it's hard when people outside of higher ed ask me what I do, like when I'm meeting random people and I have to say, I work for a software company right? and I do tech support and help center. They're like, okay, I got what you do. And I'm like, no, you don't like, let me tell you this other side of the actual, like good hard work that our, we try to do with our partners and our clients and, you know, just kind of be in their world and help save a student. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success for First Resources. You joined us for episode 43 of Cap and Gown. Rebecca, hi. Glad you could join us. Brian, everybody's slowly trickling in. You guys, I am so happy to be with you because I have had um, some chaos the last couple of Tuesdays, and so I haven't been able to join you. So I would much rather be sitting here Last week, I was at NASPA on Monday in Baltimore, and then I was supposed to come home on Monday afternoon, but they canceled my flight. So NASPA was in Baltimore. I was trying to get home to Texas, and I went Baltimore to Washington, D.C., to New Jersey, to Boston, where I missed my flight to Texas, and so I had to spend the night, and then the next morning, I took a five-hour flight from Boston to Dallas, where Matt had to come pick me up. So last week at this time, I was a little um, disheveled, so I'm much happy to <laughs> happier to be here with you guys. Um, we have one of my most favorite people in the world on today. Uh, as we continue our Ferris Spotlight sessions on um, the team that helps build our software and our best practices. So I'm going to be really excited to introduce you to her in a moment. Um, we have a lot of uh, interesting things going on about around Ferris that I will tell you about in the coming months. One thing I want to tell you about that I've just discovered is reusable sticky notes. Do you guys know about these? So they're dry erase and they stick on anything shiny. And so you can just go in and create a whole, right now I'm doing mind mapping with these reusable sticky notes, but I think they're going to be really helpful in our office as we're planning a lot of really exciting things. You also should know that I am sitting in a room with four people, plus I have Rachel Elam on, but I feel like I'm talking to myself a little bit because none of these people can talk back to me. So happy for you guys to chat to me. Hey, Josh, good to see you um, as we start with our State of the Union. So I have a lot of good articles for you today. First of all, just to check the box, you should know, Biden is looking for an increase to the maximum Pell Grant. He asked for this on Monday. So about $2,000 increase that brings the maximum annual Pell Grant up to $8,600. There's also a lot of other things um, in his budget request. So he wants to create a new grant program to reimagine the transition from high school to college. So you know we've talked a lot about that in terms of how we can kind of do an overlap of high school in the last two years and then college in the first two years. So it's a $2 million investment on a, co a career connected high school initiative to kind of support that, which I think will be really powerful if it gets passed. Also more money for TRIO um, and gear up programs has increased the budget for that about $200,000 that's in his proposal. And then I'm really excited about this one. There's a $560 million grant for the Fund for Improved Post-Secondary Education. So this is an increase up from $41 million. This grant is um, for a retention and completion grant. So they want to provide competitive grants to states and higher education systems and colleges to implement or expand evidence-based institutional level retention and completion reforms. Uh, that improves student success outcomes. So that's super exciting to think about being able to get some money uh, to fund those initiatives on your campus. So keep your eyes open for that. Of course, that has to still be approved, um, but interesting to see all of the things that are in there. Also, you guys know we've talked about this quite a bit um, in terms of remedial coursework. So Louisiana public colleges have just passed a law that they will not ask students to take remedial English and math courses for which they're not earning any credit. So they're kind of following in the um, footsteps of Florida. There was a law in Florida in 2014 that said, we're not going to do remedial courses anymore. Instead, we're going to direct our students into four credit courses, but we're going to invest in academic support for those students. 
um, remedial coursework costs students about $7 billion a year. And so there's kind of the step away. California has done the same thing. Uh, what they found after they did that is that in a single term, the number of underprepared students who earned credits, particularly in math, rose significantly. So Louisiana just got a grant of about $300,000 to help shore up all of their academic support, um, but not put students in those remedial courses, which, you know, guys, I'm kind of torn on that because I know that students a lot of times need that extra support, but we've seen schools where students are in class for two semesters, four semesters of remedial work before they ever start to gain credits, but they're paying for that remedial work, right? So that can be a really difficult position for them to be in. So I definitely like the idea of shoring up the academic support um, to help students with some of those uh, remedial classes. Um, also, you know that for the last two years, we have the standardized test sort of moratorium on we're not we don't we're not taking those anymore. It doesn't matter. Well, MIT is reversing that trend and saying they're going back to standardized tests. Uh, what I think is interesting about this is their reasoning. So their dean of admissions says that SAT and ACT predicts students preparedness because uh, specifically for math. So because MIT has such an emphasis on mathematics, all MIT students, regardless of their major, have to take two semesters of calculus and two semesters of calculus-based physics that then culminate in these challenging final exams. And so they're saying, hey, there's no path for an MIT student that it doesn't rest on this rigorous foundation of mathematics. So we have to make sure that our students are successful and ready. What I think is really interesting is that MIT said tests help identify academically prepared students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged and other common methods such as essays favor students from well-off backgrounds, which is really interesting because, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about how not relying on those tests actually uh, levels the playing field for students from all sorts of different backgrounds. So it's interesting that they're kind of saying the opposite of that. So I'll be interested to see, first of all, how that plays out. And then also what other schools follow suit with that. I'm really curious for you guys if um, you've heard anything about your institution uh, going back to ACT and SAT, and you will not be surprised to know that ACT and SAT are both like, yes, everybody should definitely start using us again. So they feel very strongly about that, not surprisingly. Um, an article in University of Business about HBCUs that are working on a program with, um, so Morehouse College and Clark Atlanta University. This program is specifically to get greater representation of um, principals of uh, color in schools. So they're saying the majority of students in the United States in K through 12 are now of color only a fifth of their principals identify similarly, and only 2% are black men. 11% um, of principals are black and 9% Hispanic, and 40% of schools lack a single teacher of color. So this program is coming. It's an online uh, certif uh, certification program that's relying on sort of nominations from school districts of people who are currently working in that school district to go and connect um, with like-minded people uh, so that they can move up into being a principal. So I love that, um, just targeting a really clear uh, problem in our schools. Okay, I'm almost done. You guys, I don't know what to say about this because I have three different articles that are talking about where we are in this semester. So um, a lot of faculty are saying they're referring to this as the let's make a deal part of the semester because students who have not been coming or haven't been turning in homework or whatever, like, hey, I want to make, I, is there something I can do to make this up? Can I turn in all of my um, previous work? Faculty are saying that they're really exhausted trying to accommodate all of that um, and feeling really overwhelmed. And there's a lot of conversation about the fact that this is really different than it has been prior to 2020 and COVID. So faculty are like, I've never seen this level of students not attending, um, that sort of thing. Like it's something is going on with these students. Well, we know this is true. The Chronicle has just released an article that's called how to give students all the grace we all need. 
um, which is really interesting. And it just goes through the litany of like, these students are in a mental health crisis, they're feeling depressed, they're lonely, they're not sleeping, they feel hopeless, they have anxiety, they have high rates of stress. And faculty are supposed to be accommodating that, right, by doing things like, here's a list of all the resources we provide and making sure that you're saying you care to students, like, hey, I want to be connected to you, you're important to me, setting up boundaries, offering flexible submissions for due dates, um, building in flex days to your semester that you can say to a student, like, yeah, you can take that if you're not feeling well. So there's that article that says, hey, we need to be having grace for our students because there's a lot going on for them. But then also so many schools are now moving back to kind of pre-COVID expectations. So University of Oregon's Academic Council has told their faculty it's time to help our students transition to customary modes of learning. That's coming directly from the Executive Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. They say this is a difficult uh, student for transition, uh, sorry, transition for students who have come to expect a level of flexibility and accommodation that is no longer necessary following the Omicron surge. It's also not sustainable. We've heard from many faculty how difficult it is to be managing these students' expectations and high number of student absences. Um, the guidance from the provost says instructors are not expected to record lectures or provide access to course material beyond what they would have done prior to the pandemic. Instructors may count attendance and participation as part of the grade as they would have previously, as long as they have a reasonable way for students to complete makeup assignments and a loss of um, credit or points. So it's really interesting to see both hey, we're having this mental health crisis that we have to figure out how to accommodate. And then also a lot of schools saying we welcome masks, but they're not mandatory. And we're going to move back to you don't have a hybrid flex schedule. We expect you to be in the classroom and we don't expect faculty to record um, their lectures and make those available for students. So pretty interesting kind of that juxtaposition. And I think that's just kind of a messiness that we're going to be living um, in for the coming semesters until we figure out how to negotiate that. The last article I have for you is a really, really interesting article that's coming um, out of the New Yorker magazine. It was just published yesterday. It's called How an Ivy League School Turned Against a Student. Please read it. It's, it's a long article, but it's pretty incredible. It's about McKinsey Fairston. The kind of subheading is McKinsey Fairston was championed as a former foster youth who had overcome an abusive childhood and won a prestigious Rhodes scholarship. Then the University of Pennsylvania accused her of lying. And so basically you have a high school student who was in an abusive situation, both from her mother and her stepfather. She got out. She was put in foster care. She went and registered um, at the University of Pennsylvania in their first generation low income program. And then after she was successful and got an undergraduate degree and a master's degree and was nominated as a Rhodes Scholar, people came back and they're like, hey, you're not first generation, you're not low income because you have parents and they're actually really wealthy parents. And so what's interesting in that article is that um, Penn First Plus, which is the program she um, applied to, defines first generation as including students who have a strained or limited relationship with a parent who has graduated from college. So they have a really broad definition of that, which is how she applied. Um, they ask questions like, at any time since you turned 13, were both your parents deceased? Were you in a foster care? Were you an independent ward of the court? Um, and so this student is responding, absolutely. From the time I was 16, I was in foster care. I didn't have parents to lean on. They were not sending me money. Um, she said, you know, because my legal guardian was the state, I was considered my only generation because they weren't, I wasn't thinking about my mom because I wasn't connected to her. Well, they came back and said, you lied. You made us believe that you were low education or low income first generation, um, but it's not really too true. What's interesting about this is there was a study on the way institutions are defining first generation. Um, one study analyzed eight different definitions of first generation commonly used by researchers and at higher uh, education institutions. And in a sample of more than 7,000 students, those qualified as first generation ranged from 22% 
to 77%, depending on which definition they used. So it's a really interesting sort of, sort of semantics conversation about how do we define first generation? How do we define um, low income? And as Matt and I were talking about this earlier, we were just talking about that identify piece of the student success funnel, that somehow the language of first generation and low income and the semantics argument about that loses the fact that this is a student who really needed support, who actually was functionally homeless and without parents. And so um, the end of the story is that she was stripped of the Rhodes Scholarship and she was allowed to get her undergraduate and master's degree, but only if she would write a statement saying she agreed to withdraw from the Rhodes Scholarship voluntarily and without pressure. So I would um, encourage you to read that article. It's just, there's so many elements in there that are really interesting about how we're finding students and supporting them. And then also some of the, you know, technical ways that we're defining um, our most at-risk students. And that is the State of the Union. So thank you guys for joining me for today. This is part of our continuation of our Ferris Spotlight where I've had this bright idea that you need to meet all of our team um, because as we're thinking about best practices and as we're thinking about building technology, the team that I'm introducing to you over the coming months, um, these are the people who are speaking into how we build things, how we think about working with students. And I told you in our last spotlight session when we talked about our director of operations, Braden Owens, like we have so much expertise on our team, registrar, career exploration and readiness, advising, res life, human resources, the bookstore, technology, I can go on and on and on. And we also have so many different kinds of students on our team. So if you think about non-traditional students, at-risk students, transfer students, first-generation students, athletes. So we are always bringing all of that perspective into our conversation. And I have the great pleasure today of introducing Rachel Elam, who is our Director of Client Support. So Lacey has chatted out her biography. Hey! Hello, friend. Hi, I'm so glad you're joining me today. I told Matt, my biggest pressure about this conversation today is just conveying to everybody how much I love you and how important you are to me. So um, we have to be careful because we are very good friends. And so we might just like veer off into chit chat, but I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try really hard to keep us focused yes. on what we need to accomplish today. So first of all, you are in Brooklyn. I am. Has spring come to Brooklyn? It's trying. We've okay. had some lovely weather days, and then there have been other days where today I think it's only like 33 degrees. So Ooh, not great. <laughs> I'm sorry. My family has just celebrated Red Bud Day, which you know is like a very sacred uh, Phillips Buck holiday, which the short of it is when you're in the dead of winter and you're looking out into the forest and it's dark and freezing cold, the first day you see the red bud purple flowers like peeking through the dead wood, you're like, okay, spring's almost here. I can hold on a little bit longer. So whenever Lillian and I, the first day we see red buds, we go have ice cream in the park because we're like, spring's coming. It's going to be okay. Sometimes it's 33 degrees, but it's coming. <laughs> it's, it's around the corner. Right. So um, I want to talk about all of your different experiences in higher education. I just want to say, I do feel a little bit like I'm introducing royalty because all of you joining us know Rachel Elam, like I said, she's our director of client support. She has done that for Ferris for almost nine years. Um, you guys should know that over nine years, her client satisfaction average rating is 98.6, which is pretty amazing. Um, and sometimes people who forget their password and you can't fix that for them are a little bit crabby. So I like to put that down to why it's not like 99.9. .9. Um, but you guys know Rachel does such a good job of supporting all of our clients, but she has a long history both with me and with Ferris Resources that I want to kind of go back through and talk about a little bit. So can I ask you some questions? Yes, please. Okay. So first of all, you and I have in common that we are Northeastern girls that came to Texas for school. Okay. So, but you were a transfer student to ACU. So can you talk about that experience, you're a first generation and transfer student. Mm -hmm. um, tell me where you started school and kind of what that experience was and then how you decided to come to ACU as a transfer student. 
Sure. So I would say I was definitely in my comfort zone when finding my first school. Um, I was in the same house growing up, uh, same private small school growing up. All of it was very same, 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 same. So um, when I was trying to pick a school, I applied to, I think, a community college and one other school that I had some friends that had attended. I picked a school that I could commute to and still stay close to everything that I knew um, and went there for a year, got into the honors college, only paid like a thousand or two thousand dollars out of pocket. It was lovely, but I wasn't happy. Yeah. And so then you decided, had you been to Texas before? Once. So okay. that was the pivoting point. Yeah. Um, my now husband uh, has family in Texas and he would always go on vacation for two weeks. So I got to go with him my summer in between everything. And I was like, everybody is so nice here. It <laughs> thunderstormed, it rained, it poured. We all got soaking wet. The campus was flooded. It was, should have been awful. Um, but everybody was so lovely. And I was like, this is not my experience. So maybe I should just go across the country. Yeah. And so when you and I were talking about this, we were saying like your parents, although they love you and they support you, they were not super helpful in the like, here's how you apply to college. Here's all the things you do. Right. Because they just didn't have that experience. Right. Right. I mean, they were happy to keep me close to home, all of that. So um, when I was like, hey, I think I want to go to Texas and was really excited. They're like, OK, but you know that like you have to do this on your own. We're not just going to like help you out and say, okay, this is great. They're like, you need to work. If this is something you really want to do, you have to work hard at it and yeah. figure out if it's really the right choice or what you want to do. So, I mean, a lot of phone calls, a lot of decisions, learned a whole lot in a very short period of time. Yeah. So did you feel, I mean, there's two parts of that. Like one is, did you feel empowered by your parents being like, okay, we have confidence and you go. Or did you feel overwhelmed or I don't know, how did you make sense of that? Um, it was a little bit of both. Um, it was a challenge, I think, wow. that I was like, okay, I want to do this. And um, it was something that I never, whenever I say like, oh, I'm never going to leave Pennsylvania. I'm never going to do this thing. I feel like those things always come true yeah. for me. So yeah, I've learned not to say never. Um, so yeah, I think it was a little bit of a challenge and I am like, a perfectionist and a procrastinator. So I think that all just kind of aligned and it yeah. was, okay, I made this decision. I've got to figure it out because school's going to happen. And were you like courted by ACU? I mean, did you have an admissions counselor like that you found or how did that happen where they were like, yes, come, we have a place for you. Yeah. So they assigned me a transfer admissions counselor and she was amazing and she had um, Northeast roots. So she understood that. Um, and she just worked really hard at finding me resources. She would set me up with the right people, put me in touch with the right contacts for either scholarships, um, special programs, um, art major wise. She was like, this admin is lovely. You need to meet with her. You need to call mm -hmm. her. Um, and then when I got there and I finally got to meet my admissions counselor in person, like we went to lunch and it was just a, a very well-rounded, lovely experience of just yeah. feeling like, okay. I can make it because I know that I have resources that I can count on and trust to say, okay, you have this question. Here's what you exactly. can do. Yeah. So did you, I mean, what happened then with your relationship with your admissions counselor? Cause we're always talking about that transition between admissions counselors, know your family, know all this stuff, help you got all the thing. Right. And then you're admitted and then you're, and then it's like, okay, see you later. So did you have a continued relationship with your admissions counselor or what was I'd that say, like? Yeah, a little bit. I'd say at least through, like my junior year, we would at least, you know, see each other on campus and little things like that. Um, but I think she set me up really well with resources and then she transitioned to a different position. Um, so she wasn't in the same role anymore. So that was a little different, but by then I had enough campus connections that yeah. it worked out. So Rachel, it just reminds me of how we're always saying, like, there's always a person, maybe there's two, maybe there's three, right. That when you look back and you say, this is the name of the person who made that transition period so much easier for me or got me the resources that I needed, or I knew I could go to their office and just be like, I'm totally overwhelmed. What do I do? Right. Mm -hmm. It's such a good reminder that those little things I'm, I'm reminded of Holly Edwards who said um, her RD knew her name. Mm -hmm. So she was going into a res hall and someone said, Hey, Holly. And she was like, Oh, okay. That's a, that's a, 
transition point for me because now I understand that I belong here, right? It's just those little connection points that make such a huge difference. Um, so you, do you remember the change from being a commuter student to being a resident student? Cause you weren't just a transfer, but you were living with your family and then you moved to be a resident student. Do you remember that transition? Uh, I do. It was not great at first. So I was in an off-campus dorm or residence. Oh, dorm, yeah. And I was also an art major and I didn't have my car the first semester. So walking two blocks to campus with art supplies and everything, that was not always great. Yeah. Um, I had a roommate that was only with me and she transferred out after her first semester. So then I had a new roommate. Um, so that was not great. I knew I needed a car because a lot of people would go home on the weekends and you, you just... I couldn't get many places um, like I can in Brooklyn now. And I love walking everywhere and we don't yeah. have a car anymore, but uh, I think it's, listen, I think the context of that is so important because I had the same experience for the first year. I did not have a car. I was on campus, but especially in West Texas, all they have is land. So they do not make things close to each other. They like make a thing and then they like skip a couple blocks and then they make <laughs> another thing. And so that is such a great example of when we're talking about the retention equation of like inputs, you have students who don't have cars and then you have institutional factors. Our school does not have a lot of stuff within walking distance, like easy walking distance, right? right? And then what you said about art supplies, like you add on to that. Wow. If we talk about an at-risk factor, it's a student without a car that has a major where they've got a lot of stuff they got to carry to and from right? That would be somebody that we might think about how do we um, bridge the gap. And I think like, um, I'm thinking of McLennan Community College that does such a great job of like, we rent bicycles, we do a uh, ride share, we have right. food pantries, right? Just like all of those little things coming together to say, here's a way that we can solve that problem for you. So I think that's a great example of like living off campus in West Texas without a car and lots of art supplies makes for a rough go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt, was, Matt just passed me a note that he and Aiden went to uh, visit the School of Mines in Colorado, and they have zip cars for their campus. So that's a great way to solve like, hey, you don't need to have a car all the time, but sometimes, right, right. when you need to go to the grocery store, or you're sick, or you've got to go run an errand, that would be a great, uh, great solution. I love that. Okay. Also, you and I have this experience of a little bit of culture shock. So I have told you many times that the first time I went to a grocery store and someone said, how are you? I was like, how is it your business? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and my friends were like, hey, you're fine. It's OK. Like we talk to each other here. Do you remember specifically looking around and being like, um, there are a bunch of rules going on at this school that I do not quite understand? For sure. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the good thing was like I had Ryan, my husband and now husband, we were dating back then. Um, so I at least had someone to kind of share all of that with a person that I really trusted and valued while I was trying to figure out, you know, friend group too, because it's like uh, being a transfer student, I was in classes with freshmen instead of sophomores. So that was different. Yeah. Um, but I do think my first job on campus really helped with all of that because I really quickly learned that you have to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir. And all of that like on the phone when you're answering things. And so you were doing, resources. that was human resources. It was. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was working with a lot of students and faculty and staff members, basically anybody across campus. So it was like very quickly, I was like learning just kind of the ropes of okay. who interacts with who and how you need to say things or how you need to ask for things. So I think that was really helpful. And just in that transition of like, okay, here's, here's how this campus works. Yeah, that's a really good example. You know, I always say like, when you don't feel like you belong, there's just all of these little signals that nobody else is paying any attention to, but that you are like, oh, note to self, that does not, I'm not fluent in this way of being, but clearly this is what's expected of me, right? And so that's a really good example of just like this subtle Okay, well, I've never done that before. I guess I will learn how to fit in here, right? <laughs> um, do you remember any barrier processes when you were a student? Do you remember anything like in that transfer process or getting housing or any of that? Do you remember any of those things where you're like, this seems like crazy town? I don't understand 
what I'm supposed to be doing here? Um, I mean, honestly, the transition was a lot better than my previous school. Hmm. Like, Cause I remember like my first school was like, I got a paper copy of my schedule printed out on like old school printer paper. Oh dear. And that was my class schedule every year. I didn't know that there was orientation at my first school. Like I didn't know any of those things. So I think having to ask so many questions before I came down to school was really helpful. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I can't think of anything that was like a huge red flag. It was just more about like the stressors of, okay, how do I do this here? All the little, I already had knowledge of a couple of those things. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So I want to talk then about major, because one of the things for you and me, Rachel, is that we've had a lot of different relationships. I got to do advising for you and for Ryan. So that was really fun. Then Braden hired you to work in the career center. And so you worked with us there for a long time. And I want to talk about that, but also you have the experience of you picked a major that you really, really loved. And then very late in the game, you had an experience where you were like, get me out of this immediately. So can you tell us that path of your major? Sure. So again, I would say it goes back to comfort zone of growing up. I always loved art. I always loved kids. I worked at our summer day camp. And so it was just like, I'm going to be an art teacher. That's I'm going to go back to my same school. I'm going to be an art teacher there. Like that was my story. I remember it was in my like senior speech, like where we went down the road, like you're going to be this, you're going to that was me. You're gonna be- I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. Um, and so when I got to the school in Texas, I, it was great. I had a lot of lovely teachers. The administrative assistant was great. I loved all my classes. The education classes were great, but we were, we talked a lot about this of like, Hey, like you're a helper, you're artistic, like all of the things like check the box. Um, but the introvert in me was not very happy once I student taught. I was exhausted. Was, yeah, so it was late when you did your student teaching, right? It was, what year were you? Were you a senior? Yeah, so senior year, it's the last thing you do. And I was a December ah. graduate. So it wasn't like the typical schedule of most people do their student teaching in their spring semester. Um, and it was just awful. And I'm glad it was awful because like my, one of my teachers got really ill. So I ended up being the only person running her classroom. Uh, I saw 600 students, elementary kids in a week. Oh my gosh. Um, and it was really, really tough. There were a lot of Sunday nights where I don't, thankfully I was married by that time because I was like, I don't want to be planning a wedding or anything like that. So luckily I had my support system, but, um, I think having that challenge be even, more challenging than it was supposed to be really was like, no, this is not for me. Even though I love the kids and I love the planning and I love doing the art, I just couldn't do it. I was not my best self. Yeah. So I want to bring that up because I think, you know, as I've said, introducing our team to all of our listeners, I just don't think that I can overstate the empathy we have for Rachel Phillips Buck as an at-risk student who didn't have friends and was unconnected and like was doing terribly academically. Rachel Zaneski who picked her major and then was like in crisis her senior year because she was like, I love my major, but I don't want to do these things right. Like all of those things, like Braden was talking about being first generation non-traditional student and how difficult that was for her. All of those um, experiences come together when we're talking about how do you communicate with students? How do you build, for example, career programs that are that are putting students? I've said to you before, I can't tell you how many times I met with a freshman who wanted to be a nurse. And I said, go spend a day at the hospital. And they came back and they were like, I hate the hospital. And I was like, "Okay, so we either need to think of a different kind of nurse or we need to think of a different thing for you. Right. So all of those experiences and remembering what that's like in in those different scenarios, I think is part of the reason why we are so careful and have such a clearly articulated philosophy when it comes to how you interact with students, because that really is coming from what we wish someone had done for us back in the day. right? Right. And I would even say too, like thinking back on connections as well, as much as I had great relationships with people in the art and the education department, once I told them that I was like, I don't think teaching's for me because they were like, but you're great at it. You're getting high reviews. Everything is great. I'm like, but it just doesn't make me happy. I'm too stressed. I'm not myself. And they're like, but you're great at it. And so then I had to fall back and be like, okay, where's that relationship now? I can't necessarily lean on them. So then to have my on-campus job with 
great supervisors, great teammates, having um, like a scholarship program that I was connected to every Monday where I could just yes. go into someone's office and just like sit there and try to figure out, okay, well, what's, what's next it was really lovely to have. Yeah. And it's such a great example of unanchoring, right? Because it's like a painful unanchoring. It's like, I love you and you love me and we want to be close to each other, but I'm not pursuing this thing that you've dedicated your whole life to. And so if you don't have an employment supervisor who's invested in you or a special program like Lene, where people are invested in you, then you really do feel it's, it's not just like a, la- a loss of community. It's like disappointment, right? Like I've right. disappointed these people who have invested and loved, loved me. I think about a student who she's in higher education now, but she came to me, she was a pre-med major and she came to me for a career counseling. And she was like, I just don't know if I want to do this. And, and I said, Hey, if no one was going to be disappointed in you, what would you change your major to? And she's like, Oh, psychology. I want to do psychology. And I was like, okay. right. So it's not that you don't know. It's just that it costs so much to be unanchored from your community, especially when you feel like you've disappointed them or haven't um, been successful in the thing that they've been trying to help you pursue. Right. That mm-hmm. is a really difficult position. But you didn't panic, I'm sure, because you were connected to me and Braden in the Career Center, and we're like, it's fine, it's fine. We're gonna figure this. <laughs> we're gonna figure this all out. I so, think I was at the right office for a career change. Yes, it absolutely. Was really helpful. <laughs> well, Rachel, what I think is um, really interesting in sort of a macro level is thinking about Braden hired you in the Career Center. You were working the front desk. You also you were there for a long time, so you were in charge of student workers, which I want to talk about that in terms of like how you took that as a responsibility. But also it's really interesting because um, Matt and I are always talking about finding creative partners and creative partners is the person who, when you, when one has a crazy idea, usually I have a crazy idea. Um, I'm thinking about discovery, which is our um, choosing your major and confirming your major program, which turned into Pathlight, which, you know, I'm happy to talk with anyone about because everyone should be doing at their school. But I had this crazy idea and I was like, okay, Rachel, we don't have a budget and we don't have any, we we literally have nothing. We have a copy machine and we have Microsoft Word and I'm going to get a name of all of the students and then we're going to make up a program. And you were like, okay, let's do it. So we wrote a book together. You were like, okay, here's, I think we were running 12 classes at a time. It was insane. In a so semester. Schedules and yeah. emails and campaigns. And it was like, I was working five to nine because that's when I could get students to come. And so we were just like, you know, 15 students at a time doing all this stuff. But I love that because I think when I'm trying to define creative partner, it's not a partner who's going to be like, here's all the reasons, Rachel Phillips Buck, that that's a crazy idea and you should not do it. It's like, okay, well, if you say we're doing it, then we're going to be awesome at it. And here's all of the things that we're going to accomplish. Right. And we did something awesome. Our institution still uses the book that we wrote. So that is still the core of their curriculum. Um, And we've been able to help other schools think through that system. And so it was, it's a great example of having somebody who has a, a reach idea and then having a person like you, which this is how we tend to work is that I have these reach ideas and you're like, okay, Rachel, but if we're going to do that, here's what we're going to do then, right? It's a, balance. <laughs> it's a very good balance. Okay. So can we talk about, you worked in the career center, but you also worked in the bookstore. And I want to talk about the bookstore specifically, because we're always talking about, like when we talked about relationships with our clients in our, our session last week, talking about employment supervisors and how they have, they are a touch point relationship for students. And you were telling me about working in the bookstore, both how you shepherded your student workers but then also connecting your work, for example, during orientation or graduation with parents into what we would want every position on a campus to do, which is how do we see the people in front of us and serve them in the best way? So can you talk a little bit about those elements? Sure. So one, I think the bookstore student worker team was the best, most diverse, like lovely group of students that I ever got a chance to work with. Um, And I think it was because they worked really hard, had weird hours, had to work events, you know, they were just kind of thrown into the mix. 
but they're handling money, they're moving boxes, they're doing textbooks, like there's a lot that they juggled. Um, but it was so fun because year after year, you'd see cousins and brothers and sisters that would come to the school and they'd be like, I want to work at the bookstore too. So I think being thrown they're into dead. that environment, yeah. right, it was just awesome. Um, and then I think being a touch point, it, it was always a lot of work, like during that first week of school or pre-session and all of that, um, where you become kind of like the advocate, like your student's going to be okay here. Like we're going to take care of them because you'd be selling a mom or a dad their first like mom or dad, like college shirt. Like I'm here to support you, but I've got to go now. Yeah. Um, and so just kind of like having those conversations and setting them at ease, knowing like, no, we're going to be here. Um, right just especially just during the thick of it where you know that everybody is so stressed out just and graduation to to too right? right like this is a monumental thing but also very emotionally exhausting for everybody right. um it reminds me of when matt and i were visiting um rochester university and we were talking about you know the promise that we make to students and how do you deliver on the promise and it was like a whole campus um presentation we were doing and we went to the bookstore afterwards and the woman was like, oh my goodness, thank you so much for giving language. Like, I want to be a part of student success. I have opportunity to do that. And now talking about how we deliver on the promise that we're going to see you and join with you in your, your um, journey and all of those sorts of things. I just feel so much um, affirmation of the way that I approach my job in the bookstore. And right, so- right. It's really interesting because, you know, sometimes we talk to a campus and they're like, we just want faculty to use early alert. And we're like, you really don't. You really want your bookstore person to be able to make a referral. You really want anybody who's who's supervising students to be able to make a referral because you and I know when we had student workers, we could tell like, hey, it's not going great today. What's happening? Right. We need to have a conversation. And that's that delivery of the connect and solve. Like, yes, you're here to do a job, but also I'm really invested in your success. That is the most important thing. So I think that's great. OK, so I want to transition then you went from the bookstore and then I stole you away because um, mostly I have have had the privilege of most of my professional career, you just being close to me. And it's so helpful because I will say, I'll be like, Hey Z, I think we should. And you're like this. And I'm like, yes, that, or we'll be working on a document. I'll be like, I think we need to change. And then you'll start changing it. So, um, when you came to Ferris, let's just recall that we had, I'm pretty sure eight clients. This is back in 2013. Mm -hmm. And our support process was my brain being like, okay, Andrea says she needs this. Jen needs this. We got to make sure we get this for Bethel. Right. Mm -hmm. And some of those clients we still have. Mm -hmm. um, but when you started, I was just like, Hey, I just have to check with you. Cause the way I've been running, this is just like, I know what all of our people need, but in order for us to get bigger, we need a plan. And you're like, yeah, we do need a plan. And so you really, in terms of Zendesk and ticketing and keeping track and processes and like helps, like documentation, help center articles, all of that kind of stuff. You are the architect of all of that from scratch. And I don't know if that's just to help your own sanity. Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> um, it definitely helps with my sanity. Because yeah, exactly. That's, that's right. Like, we've said as we've grown to like a lot of it is in my brain. So to be able to get it out into different forms and different shareable documents so that when you do ask me, where's that thing I can yeah, just you're like, you, I have share it. something with I have you. It. Yeah. Well, um, like I said, so many of you know, Rachel, Rachel Elam, she, um, so 80, 98.7% client satisfaction that's for 47,491 users. So I think when I was running supports, as in I would get emails, I think we had like 18 users and that was a stretch for me, right? So when we think about almost 50,000 users and um, so I have two questions for you about, maybe three questions for you about your work with Ferris. One thing is that I appreciate the perspective that we have with our clients, which is we are not trying to answer a question, we are trying to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So, right, because a lot of times we get a question and we're like, no, or yes, but hold on, why are you asking me that question? 
Right. What is it you're trying to accomplish and how can I use my expertise to like facilitate that? I don't know if you want to say more about that. Yeah, I think, I think one, I appreciate always learning. So if there's someone trying to solve a new problem or do yeah. a different process, I want to understand like, how do you do that? Because again, like being in higher ed for so long, I get that world, but things have changed or I, maybe I wasn't really, I didn't really interact with that office. So yeah. I'm always curious how all of the moving pieces work together. Yeah. Um, and I think it's always like a help me help you kind of situation where like, I come from the perspective of like, I wanna be treated a certain way and I wanna give you that respect. So like, tell me your story, tell me what's going on so that I can actually solve the bigger picture problem than right. just say, oh, make this form or send this email. Because at the end of the day, is that really helping a student with that relationship and that connection piece? Yeah. And so I think what our clients would say about you is, so we're, yes, we have technology, but the way that we do client support and best practices and implementation and all of those different elements, we, you are not successful unless your students are successful. So somebody's saying like, how do I turn on this form and us not being like, Hey, what are you trying to accomplish? Oh, wait, I have a better tool for you. That's going to make you right. more efficient. So you can see more students, right? Because we're not just answering a question of like form building. And one, some of my favorite things are after you have a conversation, either through support or with a client to say like, Hey, Lauren is doing something amazing, which we need to start telling our other schools about, right? So that's where that cherry picking and that library of forms and our delivery of like accessibility services. Here's a school that's doing that great. Michael at Mary Harden Baylor is doing COVID great, right? Here's how we're going to gather all of those resources. But you only gather those when you're not just answering a question, but you're actually saying like, hey, now what are you doing? Because I really want to learn about that and the facilitation of community building where we're constantly saying like, hey, you should talk to this person. They do that really well. Hey, we've seen this work at other schools, I think is so important. Um, and I guess maybe that answers the question of, you and I never think of what we do as technology support or like right. being a technology company. We just don't think about it in those terms. Mm -hmm. I think we're thinking about, we are a student success company. We are trying to improve retention. We have partner schools, but I was some the other day and they said I was a vendor and I was like, be cool, Rachel, be cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and it's hard. When people, it's hard when people outside of higher ed ask me what I do, like when I'm meeting random people and I have to say, I work for a software company right? and I do tech support and help. And they're like, okay, I got what you do. And I'm like, no, you don't like, let me tell you this other side of the actual, like good hard work that our, we try to do with our partners and our clients and, you know, just kind of be in their world and help save a student. Yeah. And you know, it's funny you say that what, what that makes me think of is the privilege that we have to resource and pour into people who do really good, but tiring work with students. And so I'm thinking about, especially, especially over COVID, there are so many times where in a 30 minute meeting, the first 15 minutes is just us saying, to our partners, like, I know you're really tired, but you're doing really good work. I know this is really difficult. Well, it's such a privilege because if you can resource those people, that trickles down then to how they're full to be able to serve their students. Right. It makes a difference, even though we don't get to spend that time with our students. And so it's just, I cannot count the number of times where we have celebrations in our office about promotions and pregnancies and marriages and right. Like we really do think of those um, partner schools and partner clients as part of our community and count it a privilege to be able to pour into them. So Rachel, what is your favorite part of your job? My, well, I think my favorite part is getting to work with so many lovely people and I, and I, I mean that both on the partner side and the team side, I don't, I couldn't do what I do without being a part of the Ferris team. Like it's a great team. I trust every single one of them. I mean, being in Brooklyn, I mean, I've been remote for several years now, a long time. Um, yeah. Pre COVID. Um, so, you know, it can be a little bit, um, isolating, I guess, but because I know that I can always count on you, Rachel, to do this or Shauna or Brit, like, or Matt, like any of our, our, team members, like I know what they're doing. Like, yeah. I don't have to question that. And I know we're always going to do, do good work. 
Um, but then working with our clients too, just hearing their stories, like you said, they're people to us. They're not just, you know, somebody that I'm going to send an email off to, like, I know you and, you know, I want to know more about you and help you. Um, but at the end of the day, my favorite part is just knowing that if my work impacts one student somewhere from either passing a class, getting through a semester, making a decision that, you know, they can be happy here or pursue something like at the end of the day, that's what really makes me happy and thankful for what I do. Yeah, it's really interesting because we've been talking recently about these big numbers of like 50,000 users and how many students and how many students would you like to impact. But, you know, you and I, from the very beginning, have had conversations of like, we hold really dear the names of some students, one student at a place, one student at a place, one student at a place, where we say, well, man, that was totally worth it. Like all the work we've done, all of the stuff, all the tools we're building, all of the things we're learning, all the support we're providing. If it's only ever that one student, that is good work that we've gotten to do, right? And so I love the micro macro where we really are trying to solve uh, problems for all students. We mm -hmm. want to break down barrier processes. We want to say like, we've learned this about this group of students, you can apply it here. But then down to individual students changing their family tree in their life because they picked the right major or somebody said, hey, I see you, I can help you through, right? Those are the kinds of things that really make a huge impact. Um, okay, well, is there anything else that you want to talk about before I do our action items for everybody? You didn't know I was going to have action items coming out of this, but oh, I always do. Too. You do. I should have seen that coming. Um, <laughs> no, I thank you for letting me know that this is, you know, not my um, favorite thing to do, but I do love talking to you. Just, yeah. you know, listen, <laughs> I was laughing because I looked up um, one of the first emails that you sent to me. I don't think I brought it with me, but it was like, you might be an introvert if it's one of the first emails you ever sent to me. And it was like, if you prefer writing to talking. And I was like, man, that's, you write so many words, Z. I do. <laughs> so then when yeah. I have to say a lot of words out loud, I'm like, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. But I should have just like different. read a script for you. Just like, this is what Rachel wants me to convey to you. Um, so my action items, you guys are, first of all, please take to heart what Rachel has said about her experience as a transfer and these little signs of um, sense of belonging. You know, we've talked about that a lot, but I think I just, it would be so interesting to get a bunch of students together and just say, give me all of the places where you were like, oh, I'm not in Kansas anymore, right? That, which is how I felt all the time being in Texas. So I think that's one thing. Also, I just encourage you to find creative partners who are going to take your crazy ideas and make them concrete. And what I love is like, Rachel, you started doing that as a student worker. So that is an innate thing in people. It's not a positional thing. It's not a like resource thing. It's not like, well, I have all this money or all these resources. So I'm going to be a great champion. No, that is like a state of mind. It is a person who says like, Sure. Let's try it. What's the worst thing that can like, happen? I want to be on your team. I want to be on your team. Yeah. And when you talk about the Ferris team, it's so nice because oftentimes, in fact, we're just in the middle of this because of some big things happening is being like our favorite people are on the bus, but it's like fruit basket turnover, right? Like, okay, now you're doing this and you're doing this. And that's what creative partners will do. They want to be on the, the team with you. They want to be in the bus with you and they're going to use their skills to make whatever crazy idea you have a reality. So I really love that. And then also thinking about you guys, if you are either a Ferris client and are not connected to our community or would like to be a Ferris client and be part of that community, so much of what we do is resource schools um, that believe in relational retention and believe in community. And so we have um, spotlight sessions that are going on all spring in on Wednesday morning, and we will probably start that again in the future. But there are lots of resources that we have so that you can be connected to us. And I'll tell you, sometimes the best thing is just to like schedule a call with us and be like, hey, what's new? What's going on? Here are some things going on on our campus and let us uh, come up with some brilliant ideas for how you can support your students. So please do that as well. Rachel, you know that we call you the hub of our entire company because the delivering on the promise that we make to our partners is squarely on your shoulders. So I am so grateful for the ways that you do that. And I love you. Thank 
you. Love you too. <laughs> thank you for joining me. You guys, thanks for joining us. Um, we will be back next week to talk more about change. But in the meantime, have a happy Tuesday.